when we were doing your PIF, I remember giving you a bit of a hard time about engagement results at MPI. I'm just looking at your business unit, your border clearance services engagement results. This is a huge move, 2012 to 2013. How did you do it? Yeah, well, it is a huge move. Um, but I said, if you're at 50% disengagement, yeah. hopefully there's only one way up or it's a tip over points. So we took a really simple approach to what we had to do. It's, these are frontline officers around the country. Yeah. They're out of Wellington. They don't really listen to the Wellington speak. Um, we had a good strategy already in place, the 2030 strategy. So they had already bought in to what they're doing. The people themselves were passionate about what they do, protecting the border and protecting the country. So that was really easy for us. They actually engaged in it. So these are the bug slugs and drugs yeah, guys at the Yeah, these are the guys airport. at the front line who actually yeah. believe passionately in what they do. They just thought the only problem with their job was Wellington and management. And if we could just let them get on and do the job, give them some decent tools, then everything would be all right. And so for us, it was a pretty rude awakening. And I, you didn't even have to do the engagement survey. You could just walk up there. The first day I walked on site and you in the job, I got all barrels, which I thought was good because they were prepared to tell me the facts, but they gave me all barrels about what was wrong and what management had done and how we'd destroyed their business. So we decided to have a free and frank or adult conversations as they call them. So we ran around the country, my entire leadership team, at the time and place that suited them because they're operational staff, so eight o'clock on a Friday night in between shifts, and let them tell us exactly what the issues were. And it was sort of a just let it get, it, get some steam off them. And, and for the first thing is a number of them said they'd never seen a level two management person in their ports. Pretty sad when our major business unit in this operational branch is Auckland, 180 staff had never seen a level two. And so we made a point that would be frequent visitors. I made a point my level three director who's based in Wellington would be there every week. And he's there every week on the floor and the conversations have gone from the moaning and the groaning to actually how can we fix these things. And so, so we did them what we called cafe series and they were challenging, I have to say. You have to have a pretty thick skin but you have to show that you're genuine and listening to these things. And so it didn't take long to get through what were the cultural issues that were facing people? What were the actual physical issues that were People had bad equipment and had simple things. I think I told you a story once about FPOS. In Queenstown, staff have been trying to get an FPOS terminal for a year. And it meant major you know, time wastage every week with tourists coming in and it was bad client service. It, they just couldn't get it. Management said it was too hard. So I sent a manager down. He looked in the morning, rang up the FPOS terminal people and for like $60 it was installed that afternoon. The staff thought he was the greatest guy in the world because he fixed their number one problem was actually we want an FPOS terminal. Same in Auckland, we had structural issues, we had old equipment. It was just about first finding out what was wrong. Yeah. What can we fix really quickly, physically? And then the next bit was obviously the larger issue was is that the distrust of management and actually the biggest distrust while they sort of, they didn't like us in Wellington, we didn't really seem to impact on them directly. What they didn't like was that their direct leaders, the team leaders and their middle management in location, they didn't think had their backs. And so when I looked into that, um, it was pretty obvious that we hadn't actually provided any leadership training to our leaders for so long. And they didn't know what was expected of them. They didn't have the skill sets to do it. And when we, actually, excuse me, when we actually went and said, you know, do you like being a leader? Some of them said, I only took it for the money and it's not worth it. And that's pretty disappointing to mm -hmm. the staff. And in some of the staff, we had brilliant potential leaders, but no opportunity for them to grow. So we did, I said, we took a sort of focused, documented what was wrong, the, the bloodletting. B, looked at the operational fixes, the mechanical fixes, yeah. the new equipment, and, the, and then the biggest focus was on the leadership. And, and so we, we went right through the leadership. We actually did a very large clean out. We removed most of the middle management. I put in all new directors as well, but most of the middle management volunteered to go when they saw what was happening. Then we ran a boot camp that I personally was involved in heavily for all the team leaders to set down my expectations of what leadership looked like. And this wasn't the theoretical leadership. This is what you're going to do to address the performance issues. This is what you're going to do to get people focused on the vision. This is what you're going to do to look at how to get more efficiency in the job. Gave it to the team leaders and then also said, if you don't think this is you, it's amnesty hour. Mm -hmm. So you've got a month to step down. And interesting enough, I thought that showed real maturity because a number of people said, you're right, I'm not, I, I can't work in this new environment because you've set the expectations and that's just, I can't do that. And you know, so we had team leaders who could not talk to people, who did not have the confidence because these were actually like scientific, some of them, yeah. 
didn't have the confidence to talk to staff. Well, that's very hard to address an issue if you're not prepared to talk to staff. So we had a number of team leaders, which I felt actually was a really good, mature sign that said, I'll put my hand up, I'll step down, allowed us to go through and find aspiring leaders within the group and bring them up. And now we've gone from no leadership training at all per year, which is terrible, to we guaranteeing 10 days a year operational, frontline, hands-on leadership. For your frontline supervisors. For my frontline supervisors. So that they all are getting, they're all confident at what they can do. Now what, with bad What's the training like before we get onto that? Um, I mean, how, how textbook versus how practical? It's not, it's pretty grunty. We bring in um, sort of operational experts. We're doing some, I do some of the bits of the programs myself. We have good facilitators. It's a very interactive program. Um, it's not about sitting down and doing 101 management. It's not about learning the right words that sound like they flow off. It's not about so much about you know the strategy and the vision and, and that. We're just trying to get them down to doing the basics well to start with. And that's this year. Next year we you know you might be able to stretch it out a bit and um, you know we'll pick some that might want to go to more LDC type environments or tertiary. At the moment we just want them to understand how they talk to people what they should do in basic monitoring of people, and then what they do when they have a performance issue. So I, I learned from my own experience addressing performance many years ago on the front line, thrown into a big um, operational environment, and I didn't have any, I didn't have the notice, it, well, the fear factor was if I get it wrong, will I end up in labour court? Yeah. It's impossible, they say, to fire somebody in the public service, and there's all these urban myths which seem to be pretty ingrained in our system. So with us, we've now designed like an emergency toolbox, which is a performance file, which is you can grab it like an earthquake quit, kit, you can grab it. And if you've got a problem, it has templated letters, it has examples, and so even a very new beginner will have some confidence they can look through it, has a template check sheet. And if you follow the six ticks and somebody counters on it, you know you've followed legal procedure. It just gives people a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. And also I've made clear that my directors in the first year have actually personally manage some of the performance issues so that they can see this is not Wellington directing them to get tough. So my director from Wellington travels to Auckland and personally undertakes, in fact right today he's in mediation again and he's been addressing all the very tough ones to show them that we will lead from the front. And the staff have very, really respected that and interesting enough too the staff have really respected that some of the really bad performers have gone and, and now they say off the record to you, thanks. Thanks, this is fantastic. Because these, we've had some bad performers dragging us down for 10, 15 years. And they've become ringleaders, and, and now that they've gone, some of the staff who seem to be quite um, problematic, would be a nice way to put it, have actually totally turned and are going, yeah, we want to work on a new MPI, we want to work as one MPI.